Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. Tonight we are coming to you, to you from the Coloma Community Center. If you hear some background noise, that is the reason. <music> Running for office, we had you on a few weeks ago. Yeah. So if you want to remind everybody why you're here and, <laughs> and, how, and maybe give us some information on the progress you've been making. Yeah, well, lots, lots, uh, a lot has developed since uh, la his last on the show. Um, I did shave a little bit. I don't know if you guys remember. I had a little bit of beard going. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I got on the ballot. Last time I was still trying to file, um, and I was able to get the appropriate number of signatures, and I was able to uh, pay, pay the fees. I rose enough money. Um, so far, I've, I've risen uh, about three or $4,000, give or take. Um, which is enough, it's a, small, it's a small election, so it's enough to get, get by, uh, typically in, in a county election, uh, you know, five, five to 10,000 is, is the average number, so I'm pretty close to what most people usually raise. Um, yeah, uh, right, right now, um, we're, we're putting out signs. Uh, I have a campaign manager now, and he's been, uh, his name is Sean, he's been doing a really good job of putting out uh, signs and, and uh, getting on me and making sure I show up to events and, and you know kissing babies and all the all the stuff that you're supposed to do when you run for, run for office. Uh, so if you ever run for office, that's, that's uh, for anybody out there. That's that's what I recommend is uh, get somebody to help you out that keep keep you online and stuff. Um, you know, definitely a lot lot is uh, a lot going on. Uh, we got we got our website back up and running, so we hired a developer and, and uh, made a lot of changes to that. So uh, you know you get more information from me at talikowski.com. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Was there, a, was there a moment that pushed you over to the edge when you're sitting there, you're just watching TV or something, going, you know what, I can't stand this anymore, I've got to do something? Yeah, I mean, the, the, growing up in L.A. County, you know, it, it, we're, we're all connected there. Right? Now, I grew up uh, in Paul Pines, um, in a very rural area, uh, and then I moved down to Cameron Park when I was a teenager, and then I left uh, L.A. County briefly for about a year or two as an adult, um, and we came back to Cameron Park, you know, because that's, that's really my, where my home is. Um, and so I, I kind of have, you know, that, that, that love for, for L.A. County, but the only problem with L.A. County uh, is there's not a lot of development. There's no economic development. Everywhere, everywhere uh, if you have a job or a high-paying job, uh, typically it's outside the county. Uh, you know, mo all the good-paying jobs, were, I remember always having to work outside of L.A. County um, very rarely did I actually ever maintain a, a career inside the county. Uh, the only people that, that are successful that work in the county are people that work for the government or, or, or got lucky starting a very successful business. Um, not a lot of people uh, ha maintain a fulfilling career, especially for younger people. You know, it's becoming a, everyone lives in LA County, but no one works in LA County. Uh, and and for, for younger people, it's even worse. Uh, for, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial and, and I, I, I see the issue of a lot of uh, other millennials that live in the county is, is there's no career option for them. It, it's just to leave. It, it becomes a retirement county. You, you go there when you retire. It's a beautiful county. It's a great county. We have tourism, but um, you know they, they put some of these restrictions. It makes, it makes it very difficult to start a business. And I've started several businesses in the county. And, and even from me as a business owner, I, you know, I've, I've seen the, uh, the roadblocks. Um, and I think that the first thing I can do as, as county supervisor is, is you know, help drive the innovation away. It was drive the uh, sorry, drive the innovation towards development, economic development, and, and keep the government out of, out of people's uh, way. You know, there's there's a lot of ways we can do this in kind of a voluntary way. We don't need necessarily need to use the government to do for us, but we can do more startup weekends, and I think we can do more economic development. We want to attract more businesses. Um, uh, the you know, what, what's what's be aligned with what's going on. I know that the uh, uh, president. Um, and then the uh, Congress have both, uh, you know, allowed hemp farming to become legalized. That's a new industry that we can we can tackle, um, just as the as a hemp level, of course. But you know, we we definitely have a lot more. We have, cause we have the FFA. You know, let's focus on farming. Let, let's do. Let's stick with what we're good at. I wouldn't necessarily jump to tech cup. I think everyone's uh, first thought is that was bring bring tech companies out there. And I work in the tech industry. Um, and, and as someone from coming from the tech industry, I wouldn't necessarily. Think that's the best route uh, unless it's it's organically started uh, simply because what happens when you bring a tech a company out there is they they have a lot to demand uh, right off the bat and if the county isn't willing to abide by their demands uh, then they start uh, forcing it to happen and a lot of times they'll start bringing in uh, importing people that, that have the skill sets they need so we have to foster that type of skill set 
right now uh, County has fostered a um, you know a, a farming skill set and, and, and more of a rural skill set uh, so let's capitalize on that let's capitalize uh, on, on that skill set um, let's not make the mistake of, of trying to tackle a skill set that we don't have an advantage on we don't necessarily have an advantage on the tech industry yes it's very profitable but we don't have that advantage and I think that's a mistake that a lot of people try to do when they bring in economic development is, is tackle an issue uh, that we don't have the advantage on we do have an advantage however uh, Mm -hmm. on farming and uh, agriculture and that type of industry. Let's, let's, let's make a, a Ella County great again. Let's, let's, let's have a, a, that industry be our, our backbone and let's you know, support the country. Ella County used to be one of the wealthiest counties in the nation. Uh, way back in the day, uh, it was lumber and mining. Lumber and mining, because we have the most natural resource. We have more natural resources than anybody else. Uh, we have more, more that offer than I think most county most counties and more than anybody else realizes. Um, you know, let's let's foster what we have and let's make let's also you know, you know let's, let's also preserve our county. You know, we we do have a very beautiful county. Uh, it's a very large county compared to other other counties throughout the nation and stuff um, as far as property wise. Uh, but let's let's also you know attract tourism. We have Tahoe, which is doing a good job yeah. in tourism. Well, let's go back for a second. You, you said you started a couple small businesses in all the Colorado counties. What were the kind of the hurdles that you, you were facing just as, a, as an individual trying to kind of figure out how to get from square zero to square one? Well, I mean, most of the businesses that I ended up starting successfully, I mean, I, I had a lot of, you know, you know business plans that I, you know, other businesses I've looked into. Um, most of the businesses I was able to do, I was able to get by uh, just fine with very little licensing because I had, you know, in-home in tech services uh, that I owned a uh, computer repair company for a while, and that was really simple. Uh, I did start a consulting business, and I did have, uh, where I had an office, and I did have to go through regulations there. Uh, but I noticed in other businesses that I've helped other people start, um, such as um, there, was, there was a nonprofit that that we were working on a few years ago. Sorry, this dust. Will uh, there was a nonprofit we were working on a few years ago, and uh, I remember it was an outside event, but the we, way the, the it was zoned, uh, we ended up having to pay pay for a carnival license, which didn't really make sense. It was just a, a it was a haunted house, right? So it was a haunted house, and it, it, but we did it outside in the, in the parking lot. We just kind of said there was no roof or anything like that. It was very safe, but we had to pay for this car carny license, which didn't really makes sense and, and uh, we had a bunch of other other licensing um, that we had to go pay for. I wasn't the, uh, the leader on, on this project, of course, uh, but I, it did help the guy that was starting it. Uh, and I just remember we, we broke even trying to raise money. Yeah. So we, we were trying to raise money to help the abused kids and everything. That was for the whole main event and virtually nothing made it to uh, you know abused kids. It, it, almost all of it went to the, towards the government. So all the licensing we had to pay, like it, it, it ate all the profits on, on raising money. And, you know, when you, when you see that kind of thing, it kind of makes you a little, a little upset that the government is, is standing in the way when you're trying to help. Um, and I, I get the, the you know, fire regulations. I, I'm not opposed to having some form of safety protocol and making sure, you know, things are safe. But there, there is a, a bur burden when you define something uh, based off of a technicality, uh, whether it's inside or outside. Because we did that same same event inside one year, and it was a different Price. Like, a whole, a whole different hold every game, and you know, it made it was more ridiculous because it was outside. Like it didn't make sense. Yeah, and I think that's part of a lot of the problem. Is a lot of these rules and regulations they don't make sense. And if you're just an average person, and you try to uh, and you try to navigate it, you need to get a lawyer or someone who's efficient at navigating these kind of things. These to, to navigate these kind of things. And I think that's if you can kind of get through, get into it, and try to do something about that. I mean, I think is one of the things we've got. One of the things our for me, at least, people have been telling us that we should try yeah, to do. Yeah, and, and I, th I think one of the things that I, I, I've been looking at as far as, uh, I remember when I first started, I was 18 years old. I just graduated high school, um, and, and I wanted to start a business. I didn't have any money whatsoever. I didn't have any money in my pocket. I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I borrowed $32 from my mom to go get a business license. And that, and that was simple to that. You know, it was $32 is nothing. I wouldn't uh, filed for a business license. Um, you know, just straight out of high school, I think I graduated like the week before or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't have a job, but was ambitious to go start a business. And I, and I, and I liked that, I learned a lot. You know, I didn't necessarily keep that business. It lasted for a while. I, I kept it for about six years. Uh, eventually I went, went over to uh, Intel Corporation, but uh, I learned a lot starting my own business. And, and I encourage anybody who, who's a young person to start a business right away, right? Right when you're young, don't wait till you're older to do it. 
do when you're young. Um, one, it, it puts some puts something on your resume, so mm -hmm. you have some some experience. You know, you're not you're not uh, having to try to work all these entry level jobs that get you nowhere, like a cashier at Taco Bell, which I was a cashier at Taco Bell when I was, when I was 15. But you know, uh, the, you, you want to have some actual experience in an industry that you want, and so I was able to get some industry experience because I started my own business. I was able to control what I what I wanted. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things I, I, I tackled that I had no business tackling because they were way over my head. But you know, I, I learned a lot from it, and I, and I got that experience of understanding how business works and how capitalism works and, and how all this stuff works. It, it taught me everything I needed to know and how to be successful in life. Uh, I'm glad I, I, I did it. And I, I think the first thing uh, that uh, is, you know scares a lot of young people is uh, the fear of all these regulations. And even now, the county, we we have we should be thankful that we have less restrictions and I think uh, a lot, lot of other counties in, in, in California uh, but you know I, I think the first thing we can do is is we can uh, maybe we can vote on we can vote on this through, through the county but we can uh, waive business licenses for uh, students I mean yeah. that, that's something that I think that we have the power to do we can we can simply waive the first year of businesses like if you're in high school or, or college or whatever you just gra graduate you still have your student ID Let's let's go ahead and let's let them start a business for a first year. It's, I mean, we're going to get that money back the next year when they're still in business, but they're going to start the business uh, knowing that they're able to get a license more so than, than having to. And it, it, it's only like thirty bucks. I mean, it's not. Yeah, and a successful business brings far more economic development than your business license is going to. Yeah, right. And, and, and it's really just it's more of just an inviting tactic is what I want to use. I want I want to invite people to do it. It's it's not so much that thirty dollars is really stopping anybody from starting a business. Uh, but I, I want to just be able to say from the county, say, hey, we're, we're on, we have your back. We want you to start a business in our county. We want you to come here and start it. We want you. To, we don't want you to leave Ella County uh, and go work in Sacramento County or or, or um, you know Placer County. We don't want want to lose uh, all the young people with other counties. We want we want them to stay here in Ella County and work here and give us wealth. And that's that leads to my next issue is the roads. You know, we, you know, problem for our county is we have a lot very large county not enough not enough people live in the county and so we have a huge road problem we have problems where, where roads go unpaid for years um and part of that is we don't have enough tax revenue and so right now the, the board is constantly looking at like oh let's raise taxes by like one and a half percent maybe they won't notice and, and it's ridiculous because you don't really have to raise taxes to tackle that problem all you have to do is is invite more businesses to be started right? let foster commerce to happen in, in LA county and you'll have more tax revenue I promise you. I promise you. You allow more businesses to happen. You will have significantly more tax revenue uh, than you'll ever have, uh, you know, by raising taxes. And, and, and actually, you, you can even prove this this to be true with the federal government. Uh, you can actually look at this data. You can take uh, our our GDP every year since 1950 to today, and then you can take the uh, tax revenue that the government, uh, the IRS, has collected. Uh, and you can and you can put this through Excel. I've actually done the, done the math here, but so you can go ahead and try it yourself if you, at home. Take this this stuff, put it in that Excel sheet, and you'll find that the tax revenue, no matter what tax policy was in place, no matter what who was a president, if it was a Democrat or Republican, uh, it di didn't matter. The tax revenue, uh, and then sometimes it fluctuated. It almost always hovered around 17% of GDP. Almost always. A few cases it would fluctuate a little higher or drop a little bit lower. Uh, for maybe a brief year or something like that, but it didn't really matter. And no matter what, it always hovered around 17% of GDP. And so what that means is uh, as you raise taxes, GDP shrinks. As you uh, lower taxes, GDP increases. So if you're only going to receive 17% of GDP, why not have the uh, interest in the people and having the best outcome for the people? I'd rather have uh, a larger economy um, mm -hmm. for, for people to have. So I mean, it's simple as that. Well, you're talking about keeping young people in El Dorado County. You know, climate change is a is an emotionally charged issue, especially for those of your generation and younger. You know, but there's so much an argument around climate change when the the real issue maybe is just how do we learn to live cleaner, right? If we learn to live cleaner, climate change will, in theory, take care of yeah, itself. I, I have a, I have a very sim simple thought process. Rather than getting really in, heated up in, in this political argument on, on climate change, I just simply say, oh, yeah, I, I want. Uh, to live in a clean city. I want to live in a clean, clean environment. So it doesn't necessarily, I, I don't really, we don't need to have this conversation whether or not climate change is a hoax or, or, or not a hoax. Uh, I, I simply, uh, you know, I want to clean, I don't want trash in the streets. You know, I, I do 
put, put my part in as, as far as keeping. I think anybody who lives in LA County is a very, very pro-green. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal um, or, or what your views are. If, if you live in LA County, you, you live in, in an area where there's trees and forests and you chose to live there. And it means that you want uh, an environment. You don't like the city life. Uh, very, 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 I mean, there's a few city-like parts of LA County, but most of LA County is not really into the city life. And those of us who are not living in the city, we don't really necessarily want you know, you know that that type of uh, uh, we don't want, you know, more development like that. We want to have a very pro environment stuff. We're all pro environmentally conscious. Um, and it it's, has nothing to do with this whole, uh, you know, background argument on, on, on science or or, or or that stuff. It, it's and I'm not even gonna, you know, I think it's it's ridiculous to have that argument because the argument is, is simple. I want to have a clean uh, county. I want my county to be clean. I don't. It doesn't matter if, if it's gonna. If the ozone is melting because of it, or not melting because of it, uh, because if, ozone, if if the environment is changing negatively because because the environment and we live a clean environment, then we, we stop that issue. But if it turns out it wasn't, there's no harm. There's no harm in, in taking care of the environment because the benefit is that we have a clean environment. We want to have a clean city. We want to be able to go out, go down the street mm -hmm. and not see trash all over the place and and have you know a very foul odor of you know uh, carbon emissions. So I'm I'm, I'm on board with, with going green. Uh, without a doubt. Uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with maybe certain restrictions that the government has, has put in and, and punishing businesses that um, may not have been, been on green, uh, have gone green all the way. Uh, I'm not necessarily, I'd have to, I think that's a case-by-case -case issue right there. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all on board. With yeah, I think we have to be careful when we, when we talk about going green. I was reading an article the other day about how a bunch of windmill, uh, windmills are ended up in the landfills because the, the blades can't be recycled. And so it's not that I'm against windmills or maybe that might be the best option maybe to have the windmills and then to bury the, the blades. That might be the, the greenest option. I, don't, I actually don't know, but we have to have the, discuss, the full discussion. We can't just have a, you know, the- Yeah, it, yeah and I, I, I don't, uh, and I, I see that, uh, and that's also an issue with, with uh, lithium and, and using all the new electric cars and the tes Tesla cars and all that stuff is because in order to uh, create the lithium ba batteries, you have to uh, do a lot of mining and stuff, and that's an impact on the environment. So yeah, I, I've, I've seen that, that side of their argument. I, I, I'm fully aware of that, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean I, I, I want to restrict that either, because I, 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 then that comes a double-edged sword. It's like, yeah. which, which way are you trying to go? Um, so I, I, I mean, like I said, I, I, I like ha seeing electric cars because I, I think it, it, you know, they, they sound great, they don't, they're not as noisy, you don't have that noise pollution. Um, you know, you don't have the emissions. So yeah, I mean, they do, they do affect it. It doesn't really help the environment if, if, like people think it does. Uh, but you know, that doesn't, doesn't mean I can't like an electric car. Yeah, well, it helps your local, um, it helps your local Plus it's smog. great for a zombie apocalypse, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> because if ga gas runs out, but you can always charge your electric car and get away from the zombies. <laughs> Well, but yeah, but you got to wait for eight hours for it to charge. Yes, they sit there and wait, but you know, it's quiet. It's quieter. You know, you know, they can't they can't hear you. Come on, if you watch every zombie movie, they always have gas powered cars. So you just turn the car on. Zombies come out. Electric car, you can just stick really. As, as, as a delivery driver, there are periods. If you're working in the city, an electric car would be great because you know you're not using electric. But if you go out into like delivering out into rural areas, you can't use an electric I got, car. I got a funny story about that actually. Yeah, so I was going up to uh, Tahoe to go snowboarding, and. I, I was I rented a, a pickup truck because um, I didn't have four wheel drive, and so I, I rented the truck and I didn't get gas my way up there. So I was like, all right, I, think I can get gas on the way back. I saw a gas station. I'll come back and I'll get gas. There's only one gas station for you know an X amount of miles. Um, and I, I calculated how much fuel I had and the stuff. It's like, all right, it's perfect, just enough. Went to snowboard and came back, and I and I go there, go to the gas station. I realize that this gas station is an electric charging station, not a gas station. <laughs> And the nearest gas station is out of the, the fuel range I have left on the truck. No. So, so what I'm, and I'm doing, I had to like coast the entire way, just just keep, keep my fingers crossed open. I didn't run out of gas, out, uh, you know, and out in the middle of the snow and everything. But that, that was almost a close call because it was, it was really funny that out in the middle of, you know, rural LA County, you would expect a gas station, but no, this place didn't have any gas. They had an electric charging station. <laughs> Dad, well, actually, that's kind of cool that there's an electric charging station kind of out in the middle of rural El Dorado County. It's, it's kind of cool. It, it, it was kind of cool. <laughs> I, I thought that too, but I was still a little annoyed because <laughs> I didn't have an electric car. I had a truck. <laughs> Well, speaking of your out in a rural area, gun control is a, is a loud issue these days here in California and around the country. And El Dorado County is, you know, the rural area. There's a higher gun 
population, a percentage of people who own guns in, in El Dorado County yeah. than there would be in Sacramento. Well, and the needs are different, right? Sacramento has vastly different needs than, say, you know, Pollock Pines in terms of gun control. So what are your thoughts on... Well, that? I mean, I, I, I support the Second, second Amendment without a doubt. Um, you know, I built most of my guns that I own. Um, you know, I, 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 su I support... Uh, I, I can't imagine any, any real reason to have any restriction on guns. I think if we have uh, actually too many, I don't think there needs to be an increase in restrictions. I think uh, maybe even less. I think we need to re uh, remove some of the, the rules we had. I think the, the whole bull button uh, rule they had for a while was stupid, where, where you had to put in uh, a button so you had to hold the gun in a weird position, which makes creates a hazard for if you're at the firing range. And, and then they overrode rode that one with a new rule where you had to take the gun apart to take the magazine out. Um, it, it's so confusing, and, and I remember ha uh, when like, California passed all these new rules, um, a lot of my friends and I who were active shooters, we, were, we weren't sure if we were in violation or not in violation, so we called, we went and talked to a local gun shop, and they're like, we, we have no idea, Can you, you might want to call the sheriff, so we called the sheriff's department, and they said, we have no idea, we don't even know how to enforce these laws. Uh, the sheriff's department do, doesn't even know what, what they're doing. And I know uh, D. Agostini, which is a pretty popular sheriff in L.A. County, his view is, uh, and he made it very clear, that, is that he can't enforce these new laws that California passed. Uh, and, I, and I support his, his decision to say that, because, because the laws they have now are just way too confusing. It, it's complicated. You have no idea, it, you know, you hold the gun this way, you're perfectly legal, hold it that way, you're a felon. Like, it, it's, that's ridiculous. I, I, and you know, at, at this point, I'm like, like I'm scared to even uh, own a gun now because I don't know if they're gonna if I buy one today and then the next year all of a sudden I'm gonna I'm a felon. Yeah, and then the, the red the rising tide of red flag laws around the country. You know that's kind of as a civil libertarians you know that's kind of scary for us, right? Yeah, that, that I mean that's absolutely rid ridiculous. I mean you can't just uh, point. That's the what's it the uh, Salem witch trials uh, McCarthyism where you just point. Oh, I think I I think that she's a witch or I think he's a communist and stuff and. And all of a sudden, that your house rating, it's the same thing now with, with guns. They go, oh, I, I think he's mentally unstable. I, I don't think he should have a gun or she should, shouldn't have a gun. And that, now the police department's at your house taking away your guns away. Uh, but you didn't do anything illegal. You, you know, you, you just, you're being accused. I mean, it, so you're essentially guilty before you've done yeah, anything. Yeah, guilty before proven innocent. Yeah. You know, I, that, that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I, I'm on board. We're, we're, of help, helping the sheriff uh, make a stand uh, against the, the, the uh, rise in gun, gun control from the state. Um, so I know that the sheriff has been act actively working on, on that and, and uh, trying to defend our Second Amendment rights. Um, so I, you know, I, I want to I want to work with them. Uh, you know, as elected supervisor, I, I would would, would un unapologetically, uh, you know, stand stand and, and make make any any way I, c I can to help fight this. I and mean, there's only so much I can do from a county level. Uh, obviously, the state overrules us, but you know, whatever we, we can do to help alleviate that those restrictions and, and uh, make, make, make maybe Ella County a sanctuary for, you know, from, from the Sanctuary counties, like uh, they've been doing in uh, Virginia, I think they've had this. Yeah, that, that's another thing is, is and I've, I've talked to a lot of people about, about maybe we should raise a county militia. I actually would thought about this before it even happened in Virginia. I was even discussing this with my friends. You know, we can, we can organize a, a county militia. We can do, um, uh, we can do uh, like kind of like bucket service. You know, bucket service used to be a thing back in the day. When, you know, when whatever fires happen, uh, you know, we have a huge fire problem in LA County. Uh, so, you know, whenever you know fire happens, we, if we can organize a local militia, we can use that to tackle both uh, a fire issue and helping with the fire department uh, tackle the, the, the huge fire problem, mm -hmm. as well as uh, helping the, the sheriff, uh, you know, ha ha handle crime, uh, and then take a stand and defend our rights. So I, I think organizing a county militia definitely would. would yeah. And I think many people misunderstand that a militia is not actually a government organized organization. They're just citizens who have cho chosen to gather together to accomplish oh, yeah, a, a it, unified it, goal. So a, well, a militia it, uh, response. So right now, the, the California state militia um, technically uh, uh, has to fall according to the Militia Act. Um, they have to follow what the, what the governor says. So uh, there is a California state organized militia. Uh, obviously, uh, the current governor in, Calif governor in California doesn't politically agree with militia, so he would never use the militia, but he does technically have the authority to call on the militia. Uh, and actually, any time you call on a militia, you are required by law to provide all members of the militia 
uh, with medical benefits. You don't have to actually pay them, but you have to get to provide them with medical benefits. I think it's just strange in history. Militias have just simply been farmers who had said gather together when, yeah, it's, when it's the time required. It's civilian operated. So it's civilian operated, but they, but they, they still have to respond and it, because we can't allow them to go, go muck. You can't have private, necessarily private militias. They're public militias. Uh, which is why it's illegal for a militia to not allow someone to join. You actually have to, uh, a militia, any militia that's organized in, in, in any county or any state uh, has to allow all members to join. Um, they, they can't deny you based off of race or, or religion or, 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 or sexual orientation or anything like that. Well, we've got a few minutes left. Um, what do you think about this whole issue over AB5 and worker freedom? I know, I know, I know a lot of, there's a lot of gig workers, a lot of Uber drivers and Amazon drivers out in your area. That's, so. yep, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a ma major, uh, that's probably the uh, major source of our revenue right now. I mean, we have to have those heavy gig jobs. I, I was doing a gig job for a while uh, called Helitech. Um, I, I worked for them for a little while. It's very similar, but the same concept only on uh, tech support. So mm -hmm. it was like a gig job type, type economy. And, uh, they haven't really reached out to me recently because I'm afraid that they're probably being restricted by this by this new law also. Uh, that it, it is a really ridiculous move, you know, having to ask them. Yeah. That. And I know a lot of rural workers, you know, maybe they're journalists and they can work in their rural areas. They don't have to come down to the city to to work. And so they're, they're, it's affecting places like yours. You're, you're going to have to move, you know, like go to New, Nevada or move down to Sacramento yeah. and to get an actual job. Got to have your side hustle, man. <laughs> yeah. In, in a world of side hustles, there's so many side hustles. and that we now we have the state of California saying no, we don't think that's good for you. So now it's going to create an underground monopoly or underground. Uh, uh, you know, we will have an underground Uber. <laughs> and, well, that's actually starting to already happen. People are you've watched in the Uber groups because Uber has made a bunch of changes. Uber's oddly enough, Uber and Lyft are the one of the few uh, organizations that aren't very affected by the laws. All the all the other ones. It's like the Amazon drivers and the Postmates drivers and the food delivery. Those are the people who have been actually been hurt. Uber and Lyft drivers have actually fared fairly well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the rest of them. And Amazon drivers have had half their hours cut. The flex drivers, the van drivers are doing well, but they were already employees. So actually the law never actually affected them. Yeah. And so that's the question. And is there anything you can do to kind of help against that political bullying, that type of political bullying from the well, county you got, supervisor you level? Vote for the right people in an office. The county, we can only do so much. Um, but uh, you know, if you want a bit more official statement, you can go ahead and follow me on Facebook. And that's it. And your your Facebook page? Uh, the Talakuski for County Supervisor 2020. And your website? Talakuski.com. All right. Thank you very much. That is about all the time we have. We would like to thank our guests for appearing. If you would like more information, we can go to libertariancounterpoint.com. If you are watching us on YouTube, please hit all the appropriate buttons, and you can search for us on your favorite social media platform. From all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching and please remember, love everybody.